welcome to Oh What A Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the First World War. As we trailed in the last episode, Jessica, Chris and I have been to the International Society for First World War Studies conference in Windsor, Canada, which we will chat about at the end. <laughs> um, a lovely time was had by all. Uh, I think we can agree Windsor was very welcoming. But first, the keynote speaker at the conference was Robert Burgoyne, whose talk was titled Redemption Trauma and Preposterous History and was about Peter Jackson's 2018 documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old. And we've asked Robert to join us to discuss the film. Robert is the author of six books and numerous essays. He was formerly the chair in film studies at the University of St Andrews and professor of English and film studies at Wayne University. Welcome, Robert. Thanks for joining us. I was going to say, let's start with um, your relationship with uh, They Shall Not Grow Old. I wondered when you first saw it in 2018, 2019, you know, what was your initial impressions? Because oddly, I think that for me, they've changed over time. Mm, that's a good point for me too. I absolutely was enthralled by it. I was blown away and I saw it in a cinema with 3D and uh, it was just so powerful and so magical. And I went with Rob Nelson and, and his wife Kim, and so he's uh, you know quite up on World War One, as we know, and had we had a wonderful conversation about it afterwards. And really, you know, my thinking about the film was continuous. I saw it again then when it was released on TV, and was again very taken with it. You know, I knew there was a project there, and I didn't know quite what it would be. I mean, I write on history and film and the way history is represented in film. I very seldom write on documentary. That's uh, unusual for me. So I kept pondering, okay, what is it that's what's happening here? Uh, what is it that, what kind of work is Peter Jackson doing with this film other than to make a really dazzling, powerful and moving piece of cinema? You know, the more research I did, I started coming up with kind of a niggling question and things that were concerning to me. What really triggered a kind of serious scholarly interest in the film, though, was that essay by Santanu Das in American Historical Re Review, AHR, where he talks about Jackson is showing the primal scenes of World War I representation. It's all Western Front. It's all the British soldiers. There's none of the kind of wider, inter what he calls the macabre cosmopolitanism of the trenches was simply not represented in the film. And the wider world global context of World War I wasn't represented whatsoever. And women were barely given a nod. And of course, I knew that, you know, there was a lot of scholarship on those, those subjects now. I mean, really, the contemporary uh, world is, it's a different World War One than the World War One that was honored and celebrated, I would say, even 15 years ago, especially in, in the UK, as the centennial fever started mounting. So that really was the essay that triggered a kind of discontent, shall we say. And then the more I, I looked into the film, I started reading some uh, archivists and people who do restorations and their take on all of the additions to the actual material that Peter Jackson and his crew made, uh, filling in frames, coloring frames, coloring images with uh, colors that may, that where the image itself didn't suggest those colors and kind of using color uh, among other things to manipulate a kind of reading. For instance, there's one, shot toward the very end of the film, which is a, a sunset as the soldiers are are uh, building a campfire of some kind. In the original footage, there's no, you couldn't tell if this is noon, morning, night. It's simply not discernible. But by putting that sunset image in, coloring it in, uh, it lends a kind of finality, a kind of closure. This is the war coming to an end now. And so there's a kind of, you know, a funny business going on there. So my initial thought was, is this supposed to be a restored documentary? It's Jackson keeps calling it that. He keeps saying that he's he's doing nothing but kind of improving the visual quality of this, that, and the other. But in fact, he was doing something a lot more, uh, I think, thematically and formally expressive and possibly even inventive, very inventive. 
So this was a this was a negative for me. Uh, that I, I was believing all the critics, but I have long wanted to get Miyake Ball's idea into some kind of piece of writing. That is, that uh, uh, quoting the past changes the past. That what comes later takes precedence over what com- came earlier. And I realized that, in fact, if I think of Jackson's work on this film as a form of quotation rather than restoration, if you think of it as a kind of a textual work, a textual operation, as opposed to a um, a kind of rediscovery of what was in the archive all along, that way the departures and the additions and the reframing that he does throughout the film, I think can be seen as a strength. And that is, it's a, uh, it's a textual work. And I discovered that I could do a kind of a textual analysis of the film that took it in a different direction than simply archival restoration. And by that, I mean the slow, mo- the use of slow motion, the use of close up, the use of repetition, all of the kind of what, more dramatic elements of the visual style and the acoustic style that were uh, there. It's a writing. He's doing almost a kind of an overwriting, a quotation. And by quoting the, uh, seeing it as quotation, that emphasizes the way in which this is actually a reframing and a a discursive kind of rethinking uh, of the past. And so that, that was of interest to me. Each time you watch the film now, do you get something more from it? There's always that element of, you know, you take something that you find super, super interesting and you kind of you dig into it. And then whilst, you know, you, you enhance it for everybody who comes after you, but you you slightly ruin it for yourself because you kind of post mortem it to death. Do you still do you still get do you get more out of the film every time you, you watch it? You know, if I were watching it just on my own, probably not at this point. I've seen it often enough. Whenever I teach a film, each time I'm watching it in a classroom or with students, that's when new ideas come and new 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 thoughts. Uh, for some reason, when you're kind of in that slightly a uh, different atmosphere, and maybe you're watching it through their eyes, or you're more attentive, simply uh, that could be. Then, then I I would most and I haven't taught the film for years, but I I would absolutely I would expect that I would see some things. But by now, I've I've uh, studied it, so <laughs> it's rather hard to, uh, rather hard to find something new. I would say just me watching it in a in my own study, for example. Really, at this point, I'm I'm uh, you're looking at it to confirm what you'd already thought, essentially. I I suppose, I suppose that's quite interesting in light of that that point about Yaki Ball's thesis that that quoting the past changes the past, and that idea that that the present takes precedence over the past. When you talked about, you know, how the war was remembered 15 years ago, and as a historian of both the war and the memory of the war, I find that slightly disturbing that, you know, what what happens to all those moments in between? So memory in the 1920s and 30s, which Adrian Gregory's looked at, memory during the Second World War, how the, the Second World War then changes things. And then, you know, even up to the present day, as you're saying, that the, now you watch it as a reconfirmation uh, of something you feel you already know. I, I'm wondering how the interim fits into to your thesis. I am very interested in the way the past takes on different contours and different dimensions. In a way, it's kind of repurposed for a contemporary audience every i think i i I don't want to make the you know huge generalizations and blanket statements but it seems to me that world war one is a a particular topic that has been rewritten in lots of different periods to express something different uh it's been re re rejiggered it's been reconfigured for instance in preparation for this podcast i watched the film 1917 again uh, which is, you know, it's a decent work. It's a it's a strong film in its own right. I think the mise en scene is really absolutely dazzling. But here's a film that is about, you know, ostensibly about World War One. It's uh, the, the setting is probably the most vivid trench no man's land uh, depiction that I've ever seen. Uh, I think it's absolutely grisly. The, 
what is it that Samuel Hines calls it? The battlefield Gothic is no more, nowhere better uh, expressed than in that film. There's one thing that really struck me that this is a film that is incorporating elements from World War II into its textual system. And in particular, it was, I, I don't know if it's an insight or not, but World War I is so often depicted and in the, uh, you know, the, uh, what, the cultural imaginary, it's so often depicted as a static war where you are entrenched and you, you fight for, you know, months to gain 30 yards and then you get pushed back to the original position. So there's this, the sense in which the, uh, I guess the imaginary associated with World War I is one where the, Soldiers are simply stuck, you know, stuck in place, stuck in the mud, stuck on the barbed wire or what have you. Whereas 1917 is all about movement. The camera never stops moving. The characters never stop moving. There's these these vast transits across space, uh, whether it's open space or... And that, to me, with the, those heavy emphasis on movement, on transit, on dynamism, with a, a more like a video game than anything else. Uh, but it's also a way in which the imagery that we associate with World War II now comes in. When we think of World War II, we think of armadas on the move. We think of fighter squadrons on the move. We think of the vast movements of troops across Europe uh, and such. And so it seems to me that in 1917, we have a pretty clear instance where a later, later war's imaginary is in effect being superimposed on an, a, a, what I guess an earlier rep- set of representations. And then looking forward, even to the uh, the constant movement and dynamism of, of a video game. And uh, if our video game expert from the conference were here, I'd be interested in hearing what he had to say. You know, I'm not a history, uh, a historian, and I'm really not a, a kind of a, a memory scholar, but I am interested in these different periods that have uh, their own memory culture around a particular conflict and then the ways in which that gets overwritten or rewritten or uh, discursively reframed. In 1917, then, do we have a feature film being a feature film? And in in We Shall Not Grow Old, we have a, a documentary trying to be a feature film as well. Because in many respects, that if you... It's funny when you mentioned the movement in it. There's a lot of movement and modernity of trains, horses. There is a lot more movement. And until you mentioned it, it just reflected back in it, you know, guns move. And the way this sort of, it, 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 it increases, it, when you look back at it, they're trying to add some of those war film, I don't want to say tropes, but ideas that you get rather than necessarily what you might have put in. If you if you had shot it like a documentary, it would have been it would look different. So it becomes more of a feature film piece of entertainment than a f- factual right. record. Yes. And you're talking about nineteen seventeen now? Uh anger. Well how nineteen seventeen compares to this shall yeah. not grow yeah. old. And just the fact that it plays at the th- at the cinema, it, it moves into the entertainment space rather than necessarily the documentary space. That's right. It does. There are certain textual effects that we in They Shall Not Grow Old that have a very a cinematic kind of drama to them. And uh, this is, uh, I've mentioned the slow motion. I've mentioned the, the use of close-up. Again, these are things that Jackson is doing to the original imagery that uh, certainly weren't there or even necessarily suggesting. And the, the kind of the rhyming patterns where certain scenes are reiterated and the scene that i isolate in isolated my talk and in the the, the chapter i've written on this film where they jackson keeps coming back to the same soldiers that same group of soldiers waiting over the top repeated six times each time it the this uh, film speed slows down even more until it absolutely almost resolves to to freeze frame uh, at that moment in close up, uh, it's, there's barely movement whatsoever. So this is a really, uh, powerful and I think important textual language that he's using. It's a cinematic language that is being used for emphasis and drama. And so it's, it's, uh, it's not a direct observational documentary cinema of any 
by any means. It's quite different. And when I first saw it in the theater, and that's the uh, aspect ratio opened up to widescreen, and uh, the 3D came on, and the movement restored to a to a kind of naturalistic movement. It was spectacular. I mean, you just go. Oh. <laughs> so, in a way, he's you know he's reminding us of the power of cinema. Uh, honestly, there. I mean, this is like one of the more spectacular moments uh, that I remember having in the theater. And what was it that we were seeing? Well, it wasn't much, but uh, it was just that kind of lifelike uh, aspect that suddenly, boom, uh, was like an exclamation point on, on a whole century of cinema, essentially. This is, uh, it's, it's a nice revelation. It's interesting because I've just been working on Rebecca West's The Return of the Soldier. One of the central characters has nightmares because of what she sees in the cinema. And that's written in 1918. You've got this, this, and there are various modernist writers who who scholars have written about the extent to which the 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 writing about the war is cinematic and is trying to get to grips with this new medium that's suddenly making the front the the, the battle closer and and more intimate in all sorts of interesting ways. The extent to which Jackson is is able to recreate that. Not just by quoting the history, but by quoting the the hundred years of intervening cinema technique that's developed to, to suddenly make everything new again, I think, and and startling, I think, is is quite quite impressive. I would be interested. I mean, they say I would be interested. No one's going to want to come, but that's fine. Um, uh, to I think it would be interesting to show the Battle of the Somme documentary and then show they shall not grow old at the same time, or not necessarily at the same time, one after another to each other. Firstly, kind of you know. There's elements of the footage that you can compare and contrast because there are, there are you know, some fairly hefty crossovers. But the very act of making a war documentary is incredibly new in 1916. To see the, the, the things that have stuck, that are recognisable in documentaries today, enough to maintain within something like They Should Not Grow Old, or the things that actually have have adapted that, you know, either Peter Jackson created by himself or is just, you know, modern audiences are more used to, but would be a really interesting comparison about the actual craft of creating those documentaries. I agree. I think um, there are certain tropes that have developed concerning World War I uh, representation, of course. And to go back to the Battle, Battle of the Somme and see what, see that before there were the, these tropes in place uh, would be interesting. I mean, one of the tropes, of course, is the, the, the anti-nature, the death of landscape of no man's land, the night patrol, uh, which uh, one author, uh, Pierre Sorlin, says allows these uh, the cine- cinema to emphasize these zones of shadow and light, these zones of, of nighttime darkness and pierced by spotlights and by bombs uh, in the distance and things like that. This is, a, again, a kind of a, a standard World War I uh, scene. Uh, one other that I think can really be called a trope, and this is, I'm going to get into this other subject now, is the prevalence of shell shock, the prevalence of war neurosis. Uh, this is, although it is almost entirely absent from Jackson's film, and evidently was absent from the Battle of the Somme as well. In the cultural discourse, this is one of the standard kind of devices for representing World War I. So I'm, I'm interested in, in how, how it would look before those tropes and conventions uh, had kind of settled in. It's, it's thinking about how, how do you visualize shell shock? There's certainly plenty of shell shock on the Battle of the Somme. Actually, one of the things the British military gets really anxious about is the number of men behind the lines who are reporting some sort of cycle, you know, who are breaking down that spikes in July, August, 1916. And what are they going to do about this? Because they're they're worried they're not going to have an army. And part of that is to do with the fact that they put a lot of the the newly trained PALS battalions and the new army battalions in at the Battle of the Somme. And it's just overwhelming for, for, for men who have no military, you know, no active military experience prior to this. So, so it's not that it isn't there. It's just not necessarily happening on the battlefield the way we 
you know, the way the tropes visualize it. And I think it's that question of visualization. There was a huge debate, and I'm trying to remember who got involved with it, about the image from the opening scenes of The Great War, the, the, the 1960s documentary, which focuses on that And it is from the Battle of the Somme, that one image of a man who everybody says, oh, the thousand yard stare. And he's got quite wild eyes. And actually what it's reminiscent of is less the Don McCullen Vietnam thousand yard stare than it is on some of the George Gross wild. Or um, is it George? I'm I'm doing my 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 George Gross thing again. the 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 German the German express oh Otto Dix yeah mixing George Gross and Otto Dix up the, the, there is that image that everyone says oh this is someone with shell shock I'm not quite sure how you visualize shell shock there are a series of very problematic medical uh, films taken um, problematic because of various things about consent and and the, the doctor, t- they're in a private hospital and the extent to which this is actual shell shock and the extent to which this is some sort of other neurosis. But it's very much about distorted limbs, awkward gait. It's not about the face. There, there's some about the face, but it's about action. There, there is actually, I think, something to be asked. and I, I'm not sure to what extent Julie Powell, who's written on the Seal Hain films, has, has asked it. But how much that process of visualization creates tropes and how much the tropes that we understand as being shell shock in film today comes from later conflicts, again, principally from Vietnam. So very good points. Very good questions. I know that that's your area of expertise. So I'm very interested in your take on it. Other than what I've already said, I'm just, I'll just mention one thing, the visualization of shell shock. Uh, I was struck when I rewatched 1917 a couple of days ago that there is a scene there that I think doesn't, it's not particularly effective, but it's toward the end of the film. And there's a, um, an officer, older gent, uh, who is completely distraught and crying and cannot answer the question about where is, you know, where's the colonel, where's the general, uh, he's, he's in the trenches, they're about to go over the top, and he's completely removed from the actual scene. That is, he can't respond, all he can do is just, uh, is break down. They're acknowledging this issue, I suppose you'd say, in that film, but that's the only instance of it. I was glad to see it there, even though I don't think it's particularly well dramatized, uh, but I was also kind of struck by the fact that it is the only instance. So it's almost like a token representation of what we now know, or what we now perceive as a trope of World War I representation. There's an interesting chicken and egg thing with a lot of this stuff. And, you know, the, the, the audience expects to see it, which therefore creates the the example of it within within the film. And I think that kind of that, that 1917 shell shock is included because it feels like the type of thing that the audience would expect to see. And again, that goes all the way back to, you know, the the, the original Battle of the Somme, you know, the, the 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 infamous slash famous staged scenes are in there because the audience would expect to see people going into into combat and potentially expect to see people people die. And it's interesting because I've shown Battle of the Somme to students for the best part of 15 years or so. And they, you know, show them the stage scene, ask them what it is that they, they think that they've seen, then go through it all. And they're always, you know, reasonably outraged about, oh God, how could you fake this bits and, and pieces? But then you explain to me, there are also quite a lot of dead bodies in the Battle of the Somme. You know, the, the, the thing that they are trying to create is the moment of attack and the moment of death. They have no issue finding dead people to put in the, the, the documentary. And that's not something that's carried on into kind of military documentaries in the same way or kind of military news coverage of, of of war in the same way that the audience doesn't necessarily expect to see dead people anymore they they do expect to see other things and and j- just just on that 1917 before we move on to, to, to audience expectations um in more detail one of the things that i find quite interesting i remember that scene and as someone who's read an awful lot of descriptions some of them post-war you know in memoirs but um some of them from letters and diaries of wartime, descriptions of what men understood to be shell shock at the time is actually closer than the mute staring or twitching um, or even some of the nightmares. Tears breaking down 
collapsing in a heap, taking oneself out of the moment actually rings very true with, with some of the written testimony that we have in a way that perhaps some of the later representations, which draw on the visual imagery of later wars and different types of combat, don't necessarily. So I think that's quite interesting. But yeah, I, I, I sort of want to follow Chris's line of thinking about what audiences expect to see and, and dead bodies in in this sort of film in particular. How, have we become more squeamish? <laughs> you know, one of the other uh, points that I think is interesting in relation to World War I representation and then subsequent wars is, uh, and th- these are the cinematic tropes. I, you know, uh, I'm giving you the... Uh, giving you my gr- the, the, the kind of the lecture notes in a very compressed way for the various World War I films I've got. And that is that there is no very little mourning of the dead in World War I film representation. Uh, when someone dies, it's a corpse. Leave it there. I don't care who it is. This is from All Quiet on the Western Front. There's a way in which the, yeah, the dead body is there, but it's just that. It's just a corpse. It's not a a fellow soldier who is lost. It's not the representation does not focus on the process of mourning. There's hardly ever a funeral. There's hardly ever a kind of last word spoken over the corpse in World War One representation. And that's that's, again, a case where 1917 kind of illustrates the fusion of World War One and World War and later forms of representation, especially World War II, where the, the leave-taking scene, the mourning scene, the burial, the, the words over the over the dead soldier, is a huge trope in World War II. If you think of saving private World War II representation, if you think of saving Private Ryan, all the, you know, what they do with the medic Wade in his body. It's, it's like a turning point in the film, the, the words that uh, uh, Captain Miller speaks over the corpse of Wade. But in World War I representation, that that mourning process is foreclosed. It's almost like the war is a is so uh, meaningless, fruitless, without any kind of sim- real symbolic regenerative purpose. And the so the soldier didn't die for a cause per se, or didn't die for uh, his brothers, his fellows. It's just a corpse. I don't care who it is. You leave it there. And so there's a, there's an interesting difference, I think. And the difference in 1917, when Blake dies, who is the young man, uh, who was charged with, you know, one of the two, when he dies, they spend some time with his dying scene and they spend some time after and the soldiers actually pick him up and move him to a better spot. But there's no, last testimonial given there's no burial there's no funeral of course they don't have time but there's a there's a film in that scene that kind of fuses the two it's gesturing toward what we expect from world war ii films and things like that where there is going to be some sort of honor you know honor and purpose and value and symbolic regeneration is uh, the death will lead to something good the death is important but there's also a sense in which they just have to discard the corpse and go. That's one way in which the visualization of the dead is, I think, much more symbolically uh, important, shall we say, in later wars, World War II and even the Vietnam War, uh, than in World War One, at least as it has been represented in film and has come to us in terms of this kind of very general cultural imaginary that I'm yeah, I was going to say that there's a real difference between film representation and and you know certainly the the testimony from memoirs and and diaries, particularly diaries. Actually, you get lots of of burials. And yes, I've been reading a lot of medical diaries so that you know the 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 doctors and the the, the hospital orderlies are, are more likely to you know they make the burial parties behind the lines. But but you know everything you're saying, I think about the film is is quite right. And again, I wonder how much that's picking up on the the visual imagery around the ceremonies of the unknown soldiers across Europe. That that that's really powerful iconography, and perhaps later filmic 
it, I, I wonder the extent to which later filmic representations don't want to sort of tread on the toes of the unknown soldier as the symbolic burial. So all other deaths have to be ignored and just left so that that one body can come to bear bear all that weight, which I hadn't really thought about before. So that's really interesting. I was I was thinking about the direct that direct address to the camera. We were talking about it, the slow motion being an act of stress and they're kind of, it is that Don McCollum thousand yards there, but that direct address gets used later. He uses it weirdly in the battle scenes, so he's there. there, there is no direct battle scenes because you sticking a camera up above the, the 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 parapet would tend to get shot. So there's quite a lot of stills artwork, but then he uses sort of the direct address of, of of men staring at the camera, but as opposed to the men before the battle, these men are grinning and smiling, and it's almost like a memorialization of the people who have been killed. And look at these sort of lions uh, who have been shot because they're laughing and smiling, which is completely the opposite of the, 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 those earlier shots of the men just staring sort of blankly into the camera that were moving very slowly. It's a very powerful uh, device he's using there. And the direct address in the battle right before they go over the top uh, is prominent. I mean, there's several soldiers looking with very... Mm, uh, kind of expressive looks directly into the camera. It's interesting because here, here's another case where, yes, that's in the original footage, obviously. It's in the Battle of the Sun footage, taken a uh, shot at a distance, however, rather than in close-up and not in slow motion. But Peter Jackson is also, I think, quoting later film uses, which is one of the things I showed in the talk I gave, where you know you see direct address to the camera is now almost a convention of war cinema, it seems. It's so uh, prominent in so many examples, and it, it's got a, a similar kind of feel to it. Everything seems to slow down. The, 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 there's a certain quiet or silence that t- ensues. There's a, a tracking in on the face, on the eyes of the soldier. Again, it's an expressive textual device Although it is in the original footage, I think it must be Jackson's awareness of this trope in later fictional film representations and in photography uh, that uh, has led to his emphasizing this device uh, in They Shall Not Grow. And uh, to me, it's extremely effective. One of the interesting aspects about the kind of the the the, the, the convincing thesis that, you know, Jackson is to use your term, you know, quoting existing war film convention and, you know, both generally and, and specific, is that that process doesn't have an end point. You know, the, the 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 end of this natural cycle is not they shall not grow old. And we find ourselves, I think, at times trapped in the the issue of both being historians and also, you know, people who have, you know, gone through COVID amnesia, that we talk about they shall not grow old as if it's a recent film. But as we were saying, you know, earlier on, it, you know, it was five years ago. The, the the first World War Centenary began nearly ten years ago. So the question then because what what do you think or what do we think the next wave of war cinema is going to take from They Shall Not Grow Old? Because, you know, it's wildly successful film. So, you know, the directors are obviously going to either have enjoyed it or gone, oh, this connected and resonated with the audience. So what do we what do we think they're going to take? What's the next evolution in the cycle? And I, I wonder if it's going to be war cinema that takes something from They Shall Not Grow Old or if it's going to be computer games. This is going to sound pretty fanciful <laughs> on my part. You've all seen Wonder Woman. Film and I've seen worse First World War films than Wonder Woman. World War One scenes in Wonder Woman and the you know the scenes in They Shall Not Grow Old and nineteen seventeen have a lot. I would say there's a fair amount in common there, except that the she's the superhero, of course. So uh, in a way, if the next evolutionary step is to turn it into a video game, which I'm sure has I I don't I'm not up on this, but uh, uh, judging from what was talked about two weeks ago, I think uh, that World War One is a pretty popular topic among video game makers. There's a, a, an, a way in which the the move from They Shall Not Grow Old to video games, as you said, or to superhero movies. What's another thing that's interesting to me is that I've written this book that you saw advertised heavily at... Uh, at the conference, writing that text, uh, the new American war film, I was, you know, I was making the case that 
all of the the major uh, kind of uh, conventions, tropes, themes of the war film that have really defined American war cinema since the time of Edison, almost. Uh, and that is the the idea of the band of brothers, the idea of the um, the last minute rescue, the idea of the uh, mystic brotherhood found only on the battlefield, the citizen soldier trying to find his way back home, uh, the, the heroic sacrifice, all of the, the these kinds of large conventions that we can automatically uh, see uh, in virtually all many, well, most war representation. Those themes seem to me to be uh, missing from the current war cinema, from the new American war film. Uh, those themes are residual. They are vestigial. You've got them. They are being given a kind of articulation, but then never, never fulfilled, never played out, never fully developed. They kind of fall short. So there's a way in which they're attenuating these themes that would have driven the narrative of, you know, a film like Saving Private Ryan, let's say, uh, had driven that narrative. Those were the main, uh, that was the main plot line, thematic line, what have you. It's heroic sacrifice, uh, the band of brothers, all of that stuff. But those themes have not disappeared. They're no longer in the war film that I see, the way I read it. But they are, they have migrated over to the superhero genre. You have, right? <laughs> where you have the band of brothers, where you have heroic sacrifice, where you have the, the, the brotherhood, the, the mystic brotherhood found only on the battlefield, where you have all of the different forces confederating together in order to defeat a galactic evil. Uh, so the superhero genre, this is where those themes have been. Uh, revitalized or revivified, but they no longer are operational in the war film post 9-11, let's say. Be interesting how uh, to see how um, Masters is it Masters of the Air that's about to come out, how that fits into that idea. Oh yes, 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 yes. Oh great. Oh yeah. Well it's a whole mini series, so think Pacific, think, you know, Band of Brothers. It'll be interesting to see how sort of that fits in with those ideas of comradeship if it's shifted. But I, I suppose that that's quite interesting in terms of Chris's question as well, is, you know, if, if the shift isn't just towards computer games, but towards the slightly longer form. And we've talked a little bit before on the differences between a film which is curtailed by, call it two and a half hours running time, but <laughs> you can push that. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, and the more expansive miniseries, which can sort of develop storylines and trope, you know, really elaborate tropes in interesting ways. It'll be interesting to see how those, you know, quota quotation, of course, is useful. If we're back to it, this idea of quotation is, is useful because it it allows you to summarize, you know, to, to pull out the, the essential element of the argument when you do it with the written word, right? You, you're always looking for that that perfect quotation that, that summarizes the whole argument when you put it in context. I'm wondering how useful quotation would be if if we are moving more towards the six episode miniseries or back towards, I suppose, because that's what the Great War did and and all these other yeah programs. Yeah, well, we'll see. It's true that you get compression in the cinema uh, that you don't necessarily get with the with the miniseries, and the compression leads to dramatic emphasis. And uh, I guess you're. So you're find, finding ways of expressing yourself that are going to be readily understood and perceived. And in a miniseries, it might take, you know, things are going to be more elaborate. The more I've, you know, thought about this, the more I've, I, I think that the war film, it's a great repository of cultural memory. I think the war film retains in its forms and in its themes, it retains the memory of all that has gone before. It's it's a layered record, and it's constantly being updated and renewed. And in some cases, the its its point and purpose is entirely reversed. I mean, the war film has been used to kind of promote an imperial nation cause. It's been used as the uh, or to express the most devastating critique of war and war fever and nation as a genre. It has both. A history of doing both 
uh, and separately and, and four different, uh, four different wars in different periods. But the idea of the war film as a kind of memory, I'll say it again, the repository of cultural memory, I think is important to keep in mind. Those tropes are there. They're going to be continued. They're going to be at least suggestions of this past world in even the newest films. There will be some sort of trace. A trace will be left. And it's interesting then how you take this archival footage and add a new t- new narrative to the archival footage so that you give a different meaning to the original film. Exactly. Yes, it's a reframing and it's a, uh, for a new, a different cultural uh, kind of uh, moment. Well, that would sort of seem like a, a, a natural place to end. With with that with that piece of thought, a fundamental thought, we could never trust what we watch ever again from the archives. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you, Robert. We'll uh, we'll let you go, uh, listener. Just in case you missed it, the new American war film by Robert Burgoyne is available now. Um, so I thought um, we might give a review of the International Society for First World War Studies conference as we're all there now, Jessica. As you are still currently the president of the society. I wonder if you have any immediate reflections. Or is it, it's probably unfair that I kick you off first, as I've, I've made notes, and I, and I have the list of speakers in front of me. I, th- I suppose we should really make you go first, Angus, given that you were the one who spoke. So, so what was your impressions like as a speaker? But um, it's slightly hard to get perspective as society president, I suppose, because... I've been to so many of these over the years. I haven't been to all of them, but it was certainly, um, as as I said to the organizers afterwards, it was very much in the tradition of the society conferences. It was very much about hearing from emerging colleagues, some really exciting work being done by emerging colleagues. It was perhaps less international than some previous conferences have been, which I think was to do with the location and timing that it was set up to be easiest for North American colleagues to make. And that was very much reflected in who who was able to be there, which in a way is great because, you know, our European conferences and our, the Antipodean conferences haven't necessarily reflected the amazing scholarship coming out of North America because, again, they're set up to reflect those time zones and, and the, the academic years that are, you know, the convenience of of one one does a conference relative to the academic year. You know, some really exciting stuff coming out. Um, my my own personal favorite, I'm going to have to say, um, it was Tommy Stevens' paper, simply because I've been wanting someone to do a history of the AS, the Army Service Corps, for years, and now somebody is doing a history of the Army Service Corps and doing a really good job with it. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that. That was most useful for me personally, but that's very much a personal thing. There was a lot of a lot of really good scholarship going on. Yeah, to- Tommy's cost me a fortune. He sent me a book reading list of which I've just gone through and realised there's lots of Army Service Corps stuff I didn't have, and I have now <laughs> seen been be, be sat and purchased. Well, I like to give. A, I have a couple of honourable mentions that I thought were fascinating. Alison Bennett's. Um, cross-border, cross-cultural sexual encounters of the First War Egypt, I thought was fascinating and had me re-watching that section of Gallipoli where they're walking around Cairo, uh, where she's, she's talking about prostitution and, and things in Cairo. I think that, that, that was fascinating. And 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 the other, other uh, paper I just thought was, my initial thought was, this is bonkers, but it was really fascinating, is uh, Julian Duncan's discussion on the recruitment of Puerto Rican Puerto Ricans into US military bands, which then helps disseminate jazz across the world as as the American army exports its bands everywhere. And I thought it was just such a, a fantastic idea of, of demonstrating how culture moved in, in, in times of war when people have been uh, pushed all over the place. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Just to note that, that Alison's paper won the Gail Braben Award for the best postgraduate paper presented at the conference um quite rightly it was it was a really excellent paper um julian's was fantastic because um he's not a historian he's a musicologist so you know this was this was first world war studies as war studies and oh dear i'm forgetting who 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 gave the paper on on teaching war studies using a war studies approach carol carol malone on on the the day when we were talking pedagogies which was was really useful because I know something that we've talked about in 
terms of the journal is it's a journal of First World War studies, not First World War history. So we're always out there, you know, trying to, to point out that we'd love to hear from people who are doing literature and people who are doing art and the history of art and and musicology, please. You know, that, as you say, Angus, it was a great paper. I always end up leaving those conferences, which is actually, and, and it's quite an affirming thing in the end. Just good grief, PhD students nowadays are smart. I mean, like many, I was an, and to many extent, still am a moron um, during my during my PhD um, years. But the the quality of the work coming out was superb. Uh, you, you know, you've already mentioned um, already mentioned Alison and and uh, Tommy Stevens. There was a guy there who called Angus who banged on for a while, but we'll move swiftly past that. The paper that I've spent the most amount of time thinking about. Um, I mean, also I, I really like Brittany Dunn's paper as well on on kind of uh, explorations of grief. There was an undergraduate there, um, Alyssa Firth's paper about kind of drag shows and military masculinity in the Canadian Army and. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that paper. I really think, I mean, me and you, Jessica, had a, had a similar conversation over, over breakfast one day. There's, there's definitely something in that that is super, super interesting. And original, that there, there is an, a Canadian exceptionalism. I mean, on this podcast, we have to say, we got, we managed to get drag shows in there. <laughs> we didn't even try. It wasn't no, us. No, no, they just, they found us. Yeah, that was, and, and that's probably reflected in, in uh, how inspirational it was. In, in, it wasn't so much uh, questions people had at the end. There was kind of an explosion of statements that people had at the end uh, of more ways to look at the at the topic. Poor, poor woman. I hope she didn't feel too overwhelmed by it all. But even like I, I wouldn't have even known how to deliver a paper when I was an undergraduate. It's just absolutely alien to me. And 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 to be frank, we we do you know I, I say this as a director of postgraduate research students. We do have a fair few starting PhD students who don't have an idea how, what they're doing. And, and that's what we're here for. That's that's why why we do PhD programs with training and the whole nine yards. But but no, there's I, I think you're quite right, Chris. The, the kids are all right. Not just the kids. Is this the point to mention? It's not the conference, but, you know, you said some guy called Angus was banging on. Yeah, that's not his name. No, anymore. no. He is, in fact, Dr. Wallace. Um, so congratulations, Angus. Um, yep, has Passed his PhD. In many ways, I feel this is really our achievement. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's no <laughs> longer Mr. Wallace. Like that that, that uh, joke of, uh, you know, Dr. Kempshaw, Professor Meyer, Mr. Wallace, no longer works. <laughs> <laughs> The old big, the big bang joke. Well, oh. shall we move on to? Because uh, it, we, we, this will be going out the first of uh, November. Um, and last this time last year, which is episode thirty-one, we looked at Giant Poppy Watch on Twitter, uh, which looks at acts of peculiar remembrance. Now, this popped into my mind yesterday because the uh, yarn bombers had been out, and there's all kinds of uh, woolen things stuck on top of things in the village I was driving through the other day. But what particularly caught my interest? On Facebook, and I, I one of those weird Facebook things where Facebook thinks it knows what you like, and it showed me two white fire extinguishers all done out with lest we forget written on, which I thought, and you could buy these things, and, and which I thought was just a bit mad. And 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 then a day later, I I thought, I, I, did I really see that? And so I googled it and turned it up on Twitter, of which some wag on Twitter had added, it's it's important to check the pressure gauge on fire extinguishers every year, lest we forget. But does a white one mean that when you press down the button, it just sprays poppies in all directions? Because that's not going to help, surely. Or if they think they're going to put the fire out, I'm afraid that uh, current affairs are proving them decidedly wrong. <laughs> I did wonder if health and safety, what they might say about, you know, it's a non-standard looking fire extinguisher. What colour is that? Is it a water? What's in that one at a, at a quick glance? There we go. I don't know if you'd seen it. I don't know if you bumped into anything, but that was one that I, I bumped into. And I, I thought it was worth, worth a giant poppy watch mention. The closest I've come was, where were we? Um, oh, Australy Park in London. We went down to, to London for the half-term holiday to do some, some culture. Went and had breakfast at Australy Park on our way home and there was some woman there with an enormous poppy and I thought that's a bit early. <laughs> um, they, people have started appearing on TV in them now. They're non-plastic this year is the big yes. the big change. Have you seen the new 
the redesign. So does that mean they rot in the... Uh, they last 364 days, so you can't reuse them? Yeah, then they self-destruct. Presum- pre- presumably they disintegrate in mud. So, moving on, Chris is our diary secretary. What will we be looking at next time? No idea. No, I don't either. We still don't yet have War Hospital, so I haven't... It hasn't emerged yet in a, as an opportunity to to expose Jessica to something computer-based and traumatising. I don't think we have plans for Christmas with Mark Connolly this year, which always upsets me because it is such a tradition. Like, like the Christmas truce. Much like, yeah, no, not like the Christmas truce at all. We we still need to look at the uh, French Netflix series. Women in War, we could do that. Has anyone watched it? I have not. I'm only barely over the Canadian jet lag. I'm trying to watch Lupin at the moment. Oh, well, so we'll be back with heaven knows what next time. <laughs> Something <laughs> First World War basis. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably. Good stuff. Well, let's leave it there then, uh, with a mystery episode next time out. Fabulous. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Oh, 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 it's a lovely one.